Hey everybody, it's Pokey. Um, so a little bit of an update. Uh, so I, I chose not to go with my um, getting my certification just because as I said in my other videos that uh, there's no viable way that I could do that and pull unemployment because I'd run into the same problem that I did this last month where I'd have to ask people for help in order to pay my house payment because I'm only barely making enough each week to pay for the bills. That's pretty much it. And I had to ask for help on getting something like, you know, toilet paper and paper towels and diapers and wipes and stuff. And one of my, um, one of my good buddies that I worked with while in the Navy, um, thank you again <laughs> for, for helping us out, by the way, you know who you are. Uh, but, um, you know, she, she asked me for my address and I, you know, she messaged me and asked me for my address and I, I had no clue why she wanted it. I thought she wanted it for, you know, pics of the kids or something because um, Connor's school pictures just came in and Alan's is not far behind. So I thought, okay, you know, she's going to want some um, uh, some pictures. And so I gave her my address and then she told me how she's going to send some stuff for us. And I, I kind of broke down crying because I was like, oh my gosh, like this is stuff I need because it was either pay my house payment or get diapers and wipes. Like I'm not kidding. Um, so it's been really hard, but I chose not to do the certification because I still would not have any way to go about that. Um, I, uh, I wanted to go to a job fair today. Unfortunately, I woke up and my knee, I was in agony. I could barely get down the stairs, um, to get the kids to, to school and daycare. It was really hard. Or, um, I've been kind of limping around all day and I was icing it earlier. Um, uh, but you know, even though I didn't make it to the job fair, I applied to five more places today and yesterday I applied to a couple. So, um, I'm really pushing it. Uh, today I applied for a job where they said I didn't meet the criteria, which of course I didn't because it said, uh, bachelor's, bachelor's or experience. And yet they always go with the bachelor. So if you don't have a bachelor's, they don't really care about experience. It really sucks. Um, but they did get back to me where they said, but we do have a job that's like 30, it's a 30 minute drive, optimal, um, traffic, which kind of sucks, but it's a fairly decent schedule. It's like eight to five and it's like 20 an hour. So I'm like, okay, I'm at least going to say yes to an interview. That'd be great. So they do virtual interviews, like online interviews where you do like a video conference with them for the first interview. Um, so I, I scheduled for one tomorrow. So hopefully it works out um, because even though the drive itself would be like 30 minutes away, that's still 20 an hour. So if I can get this job, 20 an hour is definitely, we would have a, a bit more of a cushion for our lives um, because at the bare minimum, I'd have to have like 16, 17 an hour just to just make ends meet to have a little bit on the side to kind of help in emergencies. Um, and I, I'm very frugal with money. I, I can do really well with very little because I, I had to all those years when I was in the Navy and I had, uh, ex, you know, my ex-husband had addictions that he kept feeding and kept stealing my money to go do whatever he wanted. So um, I definitely had to penny pinch a lot. Um, I had to learn how to live on an E4 with dependents uh, with debt because of my ex-husband. So, um, so like, I, but see, that's how dire it is now. Like I don't buy anything for myself hardly ever. So sometimes I will spoil myself, but I haven't spoiled myself at all. Um, I've, I haven't gone new shampoo or conditioner. Like I had some leftover from the apartment that I brought with. So when I'm done with this one, I'll use whatever's left of that. Um, usually I have to have a certain kind to help with my hair because I'm, I am very sensitive scalp. So usually I use a vino, but I'll go to Suave, you know, it's less than a dollar. It will really hurt my scalp because it'll become a little drier than usual. My hair may not suffer as much, but my scalp will. Um, I'll do whatever it takes so to save money, but I haven't, I haven't been buying anything for myself. It has been all the boys or, um, 
or it's been household items like more wool light to help with, you know, spillages or stuff like that, or spider spray because we definitely have brown recluses and, um, and wolf spiders, but mostly brown recluses in this house. So yeah, it's been, it's been difficult. Um, so when I say we're barely making ends meet, I'm not kidding. Um, so yeah, it's been kind of difficult, but hopefully this interview goes well tomorrow and maybe that means they'll want to see me in person and maybe my experience will speak for itself because I don't have a degree. I, I never had time, literally never had time. And then like the times I tried to make for it online did not go so well because it's difficult doing everything on your own. And yeah, so anyway, that's my update for that. Um, as the title of this video says, um, uh, I like duality. I like having the, the kind of light, the dark, the in-between, the gray, all that kind of stuff. Um, the examples I'm using are two of my favorite actors, uh, Robin Williams um, and Jim Carrey. Uh, I mean, I have like a bazillion other favorite actors, I'm not kidding. Like, it was really difficult to narrow it down to these two. Um, but they were very prominent as I was growing up. So that's why. And also because I really love Robin Williams and I really miss him a lot. Um, I'm trying not to cry. I, I even practiced a little bit earlier so I wouldn't cry. It's very difficult. I don't like to talk about him because Robin Williams helped me get out of some of my depression as a kid with, uh, with his comedy. So very, very difficult, very difficult when, uh, I was on my way to work, uh, when I heard over the radio and I didn't want to believe it because, you know, sometimes people say that, oh, so-and-so died and they didn't, but all the news networks were saying it, everyone, it wasn't just like some, like one or two people were saying it. Um, it wasn't like the onion was saying it, you know, no, it's, everyone was reporting. It was, he was gone. So it's difficult to talk about him. I'm trying, I'm going to try my best. Um, but what I mean by duality is for instance, these two, um, actors, they, they were known definitely predominantly for comedy and yet they did some amazing works that weren't just comedy. Um, honestly, Robin Williams, he had a lot of movies that yeah, they were considered comedy. They had some real huge depth to them. Um, for instance, people will say like Patch Adams was, you know, uh, really hilarious, but it also had a lot of depth. Not just it, if you know the story, sorry if you don't, spoilers if you haven't seen it, but I mean, come on, <laughs> it's Patch Adams. Um, so, I mean, like it's, it's one of his classics along with like Good Morning Vietnam, like have you not seen this? Um, but I mean, it was him trying to pay, like the character was trying to pave the way. I mean, he, I think they chose the perfect person to portray the real life person who did Patch Adams. Um, Robin Williams was the perfect fit for that because it wasn't just comedy. He has a full range of emotions that he shows in everything. And, and it wasn't just him doing voices. It was, he understood and empathized to such a degree, you know, he's such an amazing man. So, um, like two of my favorite comedies of his growing up were uh, Flubber. I love Flubber. I mean, a lot of people like, were like, oh, it was a trashy movie. No, I liked Flubber. Okay. I mean, I was a kid, like, of course I love Flubber. Um, it was kind of goofy and just out there, but, um, but you know, it had some heart to it. Um, and then Hook, I loved Hook. I mean, it's funny because I never really liked Peter Pan, the Disney animated one, as much as the other animated ones. Um, maybe it's because, I don't know, I probably would grow frustrated if I knew an actual Peter Pan. I'd probably get really irritated because I've always been such a mature person for my age. And I'm not talking about like, like, I'm talking about matures and I had to grow up too soon. I had to grow up and throw away my childhood. I mean, for good reason, but still. So Peter Pan seems like the person I get most irritated with. So I didn't really like Peter Pan that much. I mean, it's definitely one of Alan's favorites. <laughs> um, but 
I loved Hook because it explored the idea of what would happen if Peter grew up. And I like that. I like going past the fairy tale. I like going past the happily ever after. I like um, learning about and giving depth to the story as it continues. That's why I love Juliette Marlier's like books because she does generational books where like the seven waters trilogy, for instance, is kind of like the, um, the curse of the swans and, uh, the second one is son of the shadows. And that's following the daughters of the, the main characters, you know, from the first book. And then like the third book, um, child of the prophecy is following the next generation. So, so she does like trilogies. She does like sequels and trilogies where she's doing like next generational stuff. Um, and, and, and proceeding with this story so that you kind of glimpse what happened after the happily ever after for some characters, but you also get a sense of, um, a new story emerging. Um, sorry. She's a phenomenal, um, you know, uh, phenomenal, um, author. Like she just, she knows how to tell a story. She knows how to dive into the essence of what those characters are. And that's how I feel about Robin Williams that, um, I think did an amazing job with Hook. Like, um, so that was two of my, my favorite Flubber and Hook were two of my favorites. I mean, yeah, I love Mrs. Doubtfire. Um, I did love Good Morning Vietnam, um, and Patch Adams. And, you know, there are a lot, especially Aladdin, like, especially like his voice acting Aladdin, like Aladdin was never my favorite animated one either. Like, Maybe I didn't like Jasmine sometimes because I felt like she was very entitled. And I get it. She has never been outside the palace. I get it that she, she wants to explore. She wants to break free from her cage. Um, but I feel like she is very entitled because she is spoiled. Extremely spoiled growing up. I mean, she's a princess who's isolated. So um, I didn't like her as much because of her haughty sort of attitude. Um and I, I mean, I get why she has it, but still she wasn't my favorite off the bat. So I didn't like Aladdin in general because of that. Um, but I love the genie, of course. Like he just, to me, the genie is, is what makes a movie. And I haven't seen the live action yet, so I'm reserving judgment. Um, cause it is very important to me, the genie's role. But, but if you're going to pick someone to portray the genie in a live action, um, especially since they're doing something a bit more ethnic with it. Um, I do think Will Smith would be, you know, a good pick. So, so I do feel that already that, that I do think that if you're going to get a comedian to do the genie in a live action of something with, so he looks more, um, sound in that background, I think Will Smith would, was a good pick. So that's how I feel about that. And plus, um, Come on, it's Disney. So I know that they're going to try to do a little, something a little different or, or add songs that they originally wanted to, but they had to edit out. So I mean, like, it, I feel like these live actions are their way of redeeming themselves from being able to kind of bring back what they wanted to originally do. That's why I really did enjoy the live action Beauty and Beast. And Beauty and Beast is my favorite, like, hardcore favorite fairy tale of all time. So I'm very critical of it. Um, but I did like it. They brought in a lot of more French elements to it because it is a French fairy tale. So, and, and although they did basic, the original, uh, based it off the of kind of the remake of the original, because the original was, um, written in like 1747. Um, and then like there was a remake, like 1750, 1760s or something like that. Um, uh, like a decade later or so, someone had kind of rewritten it to something that's similar to what Disney did. So yeah, they based it off the kind of the, the watered down version. Um, but I still loved it. So, you know, um, but anyway, back to Robin Williams, I'm sorry. Um, so those were two of my favorite comedies of his. Um, and then I like that he could also do drama. I mean, granted, everything that he did had depth to it. It wasn't just comedy, but there were a couple that stood out as more dramatic than just comedy. Um, one of them was uh, What Dreams May Come. And I really felt in tune to that movie, especially considering um, my suicidal thoughts growing up and um, dealing with 
with knowing that death was around the corner, but um, trying to ignore death because I didn't want didn't want death to uh, to know I was paying attention. It's it's kind of my representation of how I felt that you know it could come at any moment. Um, I wasn't necessarily afraid of death. I was I was afraid of of leaving those I love behind, but I was still tormented by everything that I was going through. And it gets hard. There are days when you just don't want to be strong. When you just want to let someone else be strong. Let someone else take take the mantle. Let someone else deal with it. Why do why do you have to deal with it? Why do you have to to carry that burden? It hurts so much. And and you just there are days when you just like you, you just want to pass it off. You just don't want to deal with it. So what dreams may come was very personal for me in that regard. Um, and the second one was Dead Poet Society. I mean, I, I definitely love poetry. I mean, I, I've writ a, I wrote like a, um, writ. <laughs> I'm so tired. I can't even, I can't even sentence right when I'm speaking. Hmm. Um, I even wrote a book of poetry uh, at gathering all the poems over the years, um, all my light and dark poetry. Uh, but just in general, the written word. And I definitely can't remember a lot of quotes. I'm not very, I don't have like a, a perfect memory. I don't have a photographic memory. Um, I, I keep things kind of, long-term memories are more of emotions and um, and feels, you know, like how you felt, like, um, you know, if it starts to get cold or rainy outside, maybe a memory might pop up of feeling chilled to the bone, but you remember going inside having some hot cocoa or something, you know, so, uh, so long-term memories, any of my long-term memories is more of feels, um, not so much written, so I'm not very good at remembering a lot of quotes out there or anything like that. Uh, even though I read a lot of books and I read a lot of poetry. Chris, some of the greats, I'm sorry. Um, I did remember enjoying them, though. So Dead Poets Society was kind of like playing to my liter literary um, love. Um, my love of literacy, my love of the written word, my love of words in general, and, you know, the way that they can mesh together. So... I really enjoyed that movie, but it was gut wrenching at the same time because, you know, spoiler if you haven't seen it, but one of the characters dies. Uh, he wants to be an actor. He wants to go into theater, and it's very much discouraged um, by his parents, his father, who would disown him and who hated him. And the the kid, uh, if I recall correctly, committed suicide. Um, he was completely devastated and they blamed it on the teacher who Robin Williams plays, um, saying that he influenced his, this kid to do that, to do these stupid things and then commit suicide. Um, and there was a scandal and everything, uh, because it was just not proper for this guy to want to do those sort of things. Um, it was a, one of those academy, one of those prep schools, one of those prissy schools that I would definitely never go to and don't want my kids going to, even if I did have the money. Um, because uh, it feels too isolated to me. Like, I don't care about the whole education thing. Like, oh, we have better education. No, you're just more pompous about it. Because there are kids in public schools who can do 10 times better than you without the money. They don't need to prove anything about how amazing they are in society. That, you know, they can go further than you because they probably have better integrity. So I'm... I don't like a lot of those schools. I know that there are some good ones out there that aren't prissy and, and uptight, but unfortunately, anytime I've met anyone from them, um, I have a cousin who's going to one now. She's an exception because I actually got to see the school and I really liked it uh, when I was visiting family. Uh, this is years ago when she was still kind of a kid. She's so grown up now. Oh my gosh, she's a teenager. But um, uh. I like that school, the structure of it, the way that they're teaching their kids uh, respect and um, how to get along with others and, and to not just, 
you know, think for themselves, like they're really good on education and worth the money that my cousin was paying for her daughter uh, to go there. So that one I liked, but growing up, Anytime I came across, you know, some kid who went to one of those things, they were just so snobby and obnoxious. And it wasn't just, like, the kind that you base off of the movies. No, like, these people were really obnoxious. I got bullied a lot because one of them was um, a prep school that was down the street from one of the elementary schools I went to uh, in Spokane, Washington. And I was just, I hated it because I would come across these kids that would get all these really fancy cars for their parents. They didn't have to take three buses and walk through a mile of snow. Okay, closer to two miles, but I always said a mile because whatever, because it was less than two miles. Um, it was like a mile and three quarters of a mile or something like that. But still, I had to, I had to really trudge it to get to my school and... Some of the girls noticed how threadbare my clothes were or, you know, my hairstyle wasn't the greatest or, you know, what, like they would judge you. Kids are really mean. Um, you know, so it's, it's just they were obnoxious because, and I had to walk past them and it sucked and they were really horrible. I mean, they felt so entitled. So, I mean, dead poet society, when I see that kind of behavior... That snobbish behavior, like you think you're better than someone because you're going to school that boasts that it's got better education. No. And you know what? I also didn't like my own high school because it was kind of the snobbish one out of the group of high schools in Escondido. And I get it. I get it. Like every person tries to, you know, like, oh, I love my high school. Like to a degree, I love my high school. But overall, I didn't, I didn't like some of the attitude there. People were more concerned about sports than they were like the music department or art, you know, or woodworking or metal shop. Like they, they didn't see the point because sports was more popular and you had a lot of kids who had really rich parents. That was the biggest thing. Super rich parents. Um, so you had the best of everything. Now, that wasn't always the case. I know some people who had rich parents and they didn't turn out as snobbish, but still, the overall mentality was you had to be popular in a certain sense. And if you weren't, then you were ostracized. And that is what I dealt with in high school. I People don't think that I knew a lot of the rumors that were started about me because I crossed a certain person that didn't like being crossed or I said my piece and said, no, get, get the F out of my face, whatever. Um, or because... I wasn't going to back down when some snobbish teenager, you know, like some cheerleader decided that, oh, you're in my spot at a, a football game because I'm hanging out with the, the band geeks. It's like, uh, no, bitch, uh, this isn't your spot. There's no designation. And even if there were, you weren't here until the, the last half of the game and you're just flirting with whatever person you want to. Um you know, it was her off day, apparently, like she wasn't with her group. Like it was it was a group of teenagers that didn't have to a group of cheerleaders that didn't have to go for that game. So I'm like, OK, great. I'm glad that, you know, you can take your time doing whatever you want. But, I'm, you know, so it's like anyone that apparently I crossed paths with who didn't like me and a rumor was started. And it wasn't that I didn't hear the rumors. It was that I chose to ignore them. I chose to ignore all the all the bullshit that was said because I'm just like, I've got better things to deal with, you know, better things, more important things to deal with, you know, than, than that. But it doesn't mean I didn't hear it. So I'm partial to not liking certain prep academies and it's partial to not liking certain schools that have that kind of mentality, the overall mentality, because I didn't really come from anything specific. I mean, yeah, my dad was semi-rich for a short period of time when I was a kid because he worked hard for that promotion. Then he had to work hard to keep it after my mom incurred tons of debt. But that doesn't mean that I was inherently rich just because my dad made a lot of money. Like I had people who spoiled me, you know, other relatives, but it was just for a couple years. And even then I wasn't allowed to keep a lot of that. Not just because of, you know, the divorce from my parents, but also because um, when it became too excessive, we, my dad bundled up a ton of toys and went and donated them. If I was 
really being rebellious, he would do that. Like I would lose my toys. They, cause it's like, well, you have enough. So guess what? These are gone. Yeah. You know, I wasn't as the same kind of spoiled as a lot of people. And then after, you know, the start of the divorce, when my mom kidnapped me and my sister went to another state. Um, yeah, it was poverty because my mom barely made anything. And then she spent all of my dad's child support money. She never gave any of it to me and my sister. So we literally were starving half the time or she would lock me out of the house. So I'd be sleeping by the side of the house for like a couple nights, you know, like I, you know, so I, I had to go through that. And then my dad didn't have the best money when he did get custody of us because he was starting all over. And then there was okay time period where it's like, okay, we, we have a little bit of money, but not by much. Um, but I still had to work for it for anything that I had, you know, so I wasn't spoiled rotten, you know, and I didn't get anything that I wanted. <laughs> you know, even when my dad did have a little bit of money when I was a kid, it, you know, if I wanted something, he didn't just be like, oh, okay, here you go. Like, uh, did you get a good enough grade, you know, in this class? You know, did you have, you know, anything less than a B was, nope. Anything less than an A sometimes was, nope. And you also had to all have all your chores done. All the pets had to be taken care of. And by chores, I mean, I had, me and my sister had to help clean a two-story house. Windows are never fun. I hate windows, especially because I've always been short. So don't like ladders. You know, yeah. So, I mean, like, it's not like I was just handed stuff. I actually had to work for it. So anytime I have to run across prep people or people in that kind of situation where anything's happening to them, I don't like it. So... Dead Post Society was definitely me um, really rooting for the teacher and really rooting for the students who were rebelling because I was like, yeah, you better rebel. You better be against that because I hate that. I hate that that mentality. I hate that kind of persona, the, the way that people look down on others like that. I don't like it. I hate it. So if it's my choice, my kids get to go to public school, even if I had the money to send them to, pri to private school not happening like I just no it's even as an adult I've had to run across people who are like that that they just had everything handed to them and it's it's not so much that institution I it's the fact that people know better and they still choose to be that way I think that's the thing that irritates me the most Okay, I had to pause the movie because, um, well, movie, my, my movie, my little thing. Uh, I had to pause because I heard the thump downstairs or upstairs because Alan woke up and he had a nightmare. So I had to, I was rushing out there like, are you okay? And he's just like, I had a bad dream. I was like, okay. So I had to, I had to kind of sit there. It scared me so much. Like I thought he fell off his bed. I thought something happened. I thought Connor fell out of his bed. Like I just took down that one wall in his crib. So, huh, okay. Okay, we're good. Um, anyway, this video is so long. Um, yeah, but that's that's kind of like the, I definitely felt, I felt the atmosphere for Dead Poets Society. So, um, so that's, I like that faucet though. Like I like that, although there was comedy with Robin Williams, he definitely broached, the inner demons that we deal with as humans, that we deal with as people, as individuals, and um, and kind of the consequences of it too. So it definitely it definitely plays to um, one of the best examples I can think of of duality. That um, he wasn't just a one trick pony. It wasn't just comedy. You know, everything had meaning and had depth and had. It was surreal almost how how well he portrayed um, everyone's like inner heart, inner desires, inner inner demons, inner emotions, and you know just everything he did. So um, I like that though. I like the the light and the dark of everything. So yes, I love Disney, but I also love the original dark renderings of fairy tales because that's where they're from that's what they're originating from that's they weren't all sunshine and roses literally um so that's 
That's why I also miss him because I think that even though a lot of people think that some of his performances later on in life weren't as good, I, I disagree. I think it definitely shows the degradation of, of the human psyche of what goes on underneath and for many years of having to deal with that, it shows perfectly what happens when you are suffering like he was. So, um, I, I definitely think he could give the light and dark and all the gray in between. Um, and I think, I think people could learn from his performances and learn from his life, you know, uh, so yeah, that's definitely something I like for duality. Uh, the other one, Jim Carrey. Um, I chose Jim Carrey because he's also someone that I grew up with prominently in the 90s. Um, my fa my two favorites from him as far as comedy was uh, Ace Ventura, Pet Detective, When Nature Calls, um, the second one. The first one was all right, but I guess maybe it's because it had to do with like football. I'm not a sports person. I mean, if you're into sports, great, but... I don't have to deal with that noise. I don't, I have no teams, no anything. So I don't have to deal with, um, with people freaking out if I like this team or that team or the just craziness that happens when it's like sports seasons of any kind of sport. So yeah, anyway, um, maybe that's why I didn't like the first one as much. The second one I thought was downright hilarious. I could not stop laughing. Um, and then I also love the mask and I think, I think the mask was just hilarious to me because um, because in and of itself, that movie is a duality. Like, because, you know, he's one person wanting to be another person. He's this dorky, nerd kind of guy who wants to become the cool guy um, and trying to find confidence in himself. But he doesn't feel confident unless he has that mischief mask. So I think, I think that was also another perfect a comedy that's also a duality in and of itself. Um... But Jim Carrey isn't just a uh, comedy. He also does some, some drama and uh, the two that, so I'm, I'm picking two for each, you know, um, because I, I just don't want to kind of limit it to that. Um, so the two that I picked that I love the most for his drama was, uh, uh, the Truman Show was, was one. Um, uh, I think because it's someone who's definitely feels like a fledgling, like a newborn, pretty much discovering things for the first time and, and you know, wondering um, what's going on in his life and, and not feeling in control. And I think I definitely relate to that, um, feeling like nothing is ever in my control and it sucks. Um, it's not like I'm a control freak. I just don't, I've been put down so much. I've been caged so much that I just, I don't like that. I don't like being handled like that. Um, I don't like it when people try to handle me like that. So I, I like to be my own person. I like to be able to decide. So if anyone tries to control me or manipulate me, I don't take too kindly to it. So I think that's why I definitely related to The Truman Show. Um, Eternal uh, Sunshine on Spotless Mind was that my, my second favorite for drama. Because um, I mean, like, yeah, there's some comedy, but I think it speaks to the romantic in me. Because um, a lot of it's very heart-wrenching. Uh, I think it's because there are times when some people I know have told me that they wish they could forget. And I think I shocked them because they asked me, is like, have you ever felt like that? I said, no, I've never felt like that. I've never felt like I wanted to erase um, part of my life because there are parts of my life that I don't remember. I literally blocked it from my mind because it was too traumatic and I like I've gone to counselors and psychiatrists I've gone to people who have analyzed me for that where there are some moments in my life um I remember perfectly when my sister was born I remember some moments after my sister was born and some of the moments in the apartment that we were living in before we moved to Tehachapi when we were still in Thousand Oaks um you know the times when we were in the apartments that uh that you could have horses because there's candy and sugar these two horses that I grew up with that uh, grew up around, you know, and got to ride and hang out with. I think it was Candy was the one that was the temperamental one. I'm not kidding. I'm like three years old, three and a half years old, four years old, and no one could get near that horse. Like, no one. They just, 
she was just temperamental, like nobody's business. She just, she is very cantankerous horse. She, she hated people. Um, but I come over, calmest beast in the world. I say beast loosely because I don't mean like a beast, you know, but a uh, creature, calmest creature, you know, it's, um, cause she was very beastly. She was very beastly, but I was definitely the beauty to her beast. Like I, I don't know what it was about me. I don't know. Maybe it's because I love animals. Maybe it's because I really love horses, but I think that shaped my love for horses the most because there was some sort of emotional connection between us two. Like I remember that distinctly and most, most children can't identify or recall things from certain ages because they're too young. They haven't become self-aware or conscious of anything. Um, but I did, um, my first memories are literally around the time that my sister was born. That was a very monumental thing for me. And, you know, and past that, however, the entire year when I was four years old, I don't remember very well. I do remember specifically being away from home briefly um, before I turned five. And there was even a picture I found once where I'm sitting on a rock and I'm kind of, you know, like that. I'm like four years old. I showed it to my dad and he didn't remember what I was taking at all. He had no recognition of the place. It was very, very bland. There was like a, a wooden fence behind like, you know, two, uh, piece, like, you know, wooden fence with posts. Um, and it's just very well manicured, very lush green, uh, lawn kind of grass cut nice and short. And then a rock that is, you know, not very tall, not very wide. I, it was more, oblong or oval than anything um it wasn't it wasn't very high but I was sitting at the, the edge of it um and there's no recollection of that picture of who I'm with um but I was away from my family and I don't recall and none of my family members recall no one remembers uh and that was when I was four until I turned five I don't remember um and a counselor, there was, there was, well, I say counselor, but technically it was therapist. Therapist uh, said maybe I blocked something out. Um, the feelings I had were something bad happened and I don't remember what. Um, literally no memories. And then there were times when I was with my mom during the divorce that I don't remember that I blocked out. So there are times when I don't have any memories at all of stuff. Um, but when they, when that person asked, you know, you know, has, have you ever felt like you just wanted to erase some of your memories? And I wasn't thinking about those memories that had been erased because they're too traumatic because people can block out stuff that your memories are gone for good. If you ever seen the movie Inside Out, um, certain memories of hers disappear as, uh, as her mind kind of decays with her depression and is spoiler alert if you haven't seen it um but um one of her imaginary friends memories of her imaginary friend disappear uh during that breakdown it's kind of like that when you're when you go through a traumatic experience and you block things out it's kind of like that where your mind just it's gone i don't want to ever see it again so that had happened to me um but it wasn't those things that I was thinking about when I said, no, I've never wanted to erase my memories. It's because although it's torturous and it hurts a lot of the memories that I have, I also have a lot of good memories um, that stem from the bad memories. So to me, to erase one means to erase all. And I think that's why I cried a lot during uh, Eternal Sunshine on Spotless Mind because it was, to me, it was, it was hard. It was hard to watch that because for me, I don't have regrets. I, not those kinds of regrets um, because I'm living life. If I can't feel, if I don't have emotion, if I erase everything, then I feel like I'm erasing myself because I am made up of what I feel. Um, how I react to things and I feel that's in the core of who I am the way that I reacted to stuff in the moment with what I had at that time but it's still important to me and it's important for me to remember that because 
it helped build me and break me down and remodel me into something that understood things on a greater scale as I grew older, as I matured. So therefore, to erase the beginning stages, to erase how I figured something out or how I became something, to erase that is to erase my actual existence. So that movie definitely destroyed me. <laughs> You know, because they're trying to forget each other, and it's 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 heart wrenching. It is so heart wrenching. I have, I cannot tell you. Oh my gosh! So that's why I only saw it once, and I don't I don't know if I could have the courage to see it again. But I really loved, really loved seeing Jim Carrey in that role. It it broke my heart and made me happy to see him in that role at the same time. So, uh. For the duality, that's, you know, that's why I chose. There's comedy and there's drama. Um, you know, two things that people sometimes can mesh. Like, Robin Williams definitely meshed it. I know there are examples of Jim Carrey meshing it, too. Uh, liar, Liar, I think, is a good one. Because there's a lot of comedy. But it's very, it's very devastating in some ways. Because it's a family situation that he's going through. So, I mean, you know. Um, uh, Bruce Almighty. Oh uh, that was pretty funny. Um, I mean, it's got a lot of hilarity, but it also boils down to free will and choosing not to interfere and, you know, um, how you react to a situation, how you define yourself. So, I mean, both actors have ways of blending things. Really good actors can blend more than one kind of genre into something. And so I think it's difficult sometimes for the people to see it as comedy or drama or romance or whatever. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of most rom-coms because a lot of them seem too cheesy to me, but there are a few exceptions. So, I mean, I'm not going to talk about that in this one though, but, um, but yeah, that's my, those are two examples. Like those two actors are my examples of duality that I really like. I really like having the, the light and the dark, um, I like having some of the gray in between. Uh, I like having balance, I guess, is the best way to describe it. Uh, balance is very important to me. It's very key. I don't like things to be tipped too far to one side. That's why I think over time, yeah, I yammer and haul and uh, holler and I, um, and I whine kind of bitch about things here or there. Oh, especially my current situation because it sucks. I have every right to complain, but um, there are sometimes, uh, a lot of times when certain things happen, people think that uh, I would usually be up in arms about, and and it, internally I might be, but at the same time, I I don't get as freaked out or stressed about certain things like I used to, and I think it's because I feel like the universe is keeping things in check for all the good that this does over here you have to have some bad that goes with it so that's how i see it so when when bad things happen on um on the smaller scales uh i don't get as upset because i'm just like it happened what am i supposed to do all i'm going to do is complain and whine and all i'm going to do is is fret over it and my anxiety is going to kick in and then i'm going to waste my time freaking out over something that I can't change because it's already occurred. So, yes, I, my anxiety will kick in randomly at any time. But I don't want to invite it. <laughs> you know, if it's going to barrel down the door uninvited, just out of the blue, I mean, that's going to happen. That's what anxiety does. It just comes over and it's like, hey, can I use your phone? Thanks. Hey, can I borrow some milk and sugar? Can I do this? Can I do that? Yeah, I'm going to do it anyway, whether you want to allow me to or not. Um, so that's how anxiety is. But that doesn't mean I want to invite anxiety. So I feel like if I got freaked out about something, like if I really allow myself to freak out over stuff that I can't change, that it just, it happened, there's nothing that I can really do about it. Why invite anxiety over, you know? <laughs> so that's how I see that, um, is... I, I'd rather not invite anxiety. Anxiety is going to come over whether I want to or not, but I better not um, waste my time because I have more important things to do with in life. 
So that's how I see it is the balance, the duality. And so I like seeing that in other places. I like seeing the balance, seeing how things are maintained. Um, so I definitely do not enjoy when things are tipped too far over. Um, I mean, it sucks because bad things keep happening around me. It just, it does. And maybe that's why I don't have a relationship. Maybe that's why they all fail because they all caught on to my curse, my Murphy's Law curse. Anything bad that can, you know, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. That's pretty much my life. So maybe all of them are being smart and saying, no, we're just going to stay away. So even the ones that could potentially be nice matches for me decide that, no, no, we're just going to be smart. And so instead of looking at them as cowards, I'm just going to be like, no, you're probably smart to stay away from me because bad things just happen. Um, a lot of good things, but also a lot of bad things. I think it's because I try to maintain a balanced life, but I think most importantly, the universe decided that it's just going to do it for me. Um, so yeah, that's definitely uh, to go along with my video that I, I like the duality. I like seeing the balance of things. Um, I don't like a lot of the bad stuff that happens to me, but so a lot of there, there's a lot out there that there's nothing I can do about it. It just happens. You know, I don't really uh, believe in coincidence that much. Sorry, there was like a hair on my left. Um, yeah, I don't really believe in coincidence that much. Um, I believe things happen for a reason. So, yeah. Um, anyway, super long video. Uh. Mostly because I had to regain my train of thought because I had too many tangents. That's the other thing, if you haven't noticed already in my videos, I go on a million tangents. Um, I think that's why there are some friends that I get along with more than anyone else. And that's because I can literally go on crazy tangent conversations that will last hours. Um, but with them, I can retrace my steps exactly. Like I, So one of my, one of my buddies... From high school which coincidentally I, I it was the dude that i dated recently he walked in on me talking to the the guy that i call my older brother and we're having some crazy tangent moments and he's just like do you guys even know what, like what you're saying like what tangents you've gone on i was like yes actually i do remember and i literally categorically went through every single tangent that we went went to back to the root of it. So like you have the root of the conversation and you branch off, branch off, branch off, branch off, branch off to all these different branches and the conversation with these tangents. I was able to reconnect all those branches before getting to the root of what I, where we started and retrace our steps in the conversation as it were. And he just kind of looked at me like, okay, <laughs> like that's kind of crazy, but okay. I was like, what, you can't do that? <laughs> like. I can do that with only a couple different people, though. So my big brother was one of them. Um, the other one I'm not going to talk about. But anyway, <laughs> so uh, so if you pay attention at all during these videos, you know that I have crazy tangents. Um, and a lot of it I cannot help because, sorry, I have like more bug bites. <sighs> I hate these bugs. They, I've got like O positive blood, so... I'm told that bugs love O positive. I don't know. Sorry. Oh, I'm just like so itchy because of these bug bites. There's even some like on my, my chest and my neck and it's just, yeah. Um, I can't really help a lot of the tangents though. They just, they just come unbidden and either I follow the tangents or it bugs me until I follow the tangent. So, uh, if there is a cure for that, <laughs> I would definitely love to know about it, but um, anytime I've tried any of those self-help books, they never worked. And I've tried like meditation, um, classical meditation, and many other kinds of meditation. It doesn't work to clear my mind. The best thing that I can do is follow the tangents or give myself an activity to distract me long enough um, so I don't get overwhelmed with not following the tangent. Uh, so that's why I like to stay busy. If I'm idle, those tangents become a nightmare for me um, because then I definitely want to follow the tangents and I can't do that all at once. So I'm stretched between too many different avenues of approach where, um, where I don't, I don't know how to proceed. And so then I get overwhelmed. 
So that's why idleness does not work well for me. I have to always be doing something. Otherwise, the tangents just create chaos in my mind. But um, but I, I can't, the best way that I found that can still that or uh, have the, the semblance of, um, of peace and quiet is um, keeping busy. Because then it, it boils down to me distracting myself long enough to where the variety of tangents, the, the overwhelming number of tangents doesn't destroy me. Um, because I can't follow them all at once. So then I can pick and choose which tangents I go on. If I'm distracted, I can be like, okay, so instead of thinking of like 50 different things and trying to do all those things at once, like researching this or going and doing that, I can think of 20 different things and I can research like 10 of those at the same time and read about like three of them at the same time, like three different books or whatever. So I might have a tangent where in my brain that goes over you know, a specific fairy tale and me wanting to research, like, has anyone ever retold it in this way? Or what was the original fairy tale like? Blah, blah, blah. What was the origin of this? Because then I will want to research and find stuff out. And then, like, I could be thinking about, like, animals. So I really, really love animals. And I loved Magic School Bus growing up. I had a third grade teacher, Mrs. Smith, who was literally, like, the living embodiment of a, of, um, of the, magic school was teacher um miss frizzle i couldn't think of it for me but miss frizzle so like i knew a lot of animal trilogy uh trilogy um trivia when i was growing up and so like sometimes i'll be thinking of animal uh trivia at the same time then thinking about uh fairy tale stuff and then i'll be thinking about the best way to clean such and such in my house and then how am i going to rearrange this and okay so this bill is coming up and then um, I might think of mechanics, like how does this work or, you know, what, what do they use for this material for this engine, blah, blah, blah. Like it just, my tangents are all over the place. So, um, so yeah, not being idle is the best, is the best medicine I found for that. But if there's a better cure, <laughs> I'd be open to it. Anyway, that was the biggest tangent I've ever gone on is talking about tangents in a video that doesn't really go over tangents, but there's my duality. I have like a piece of hair that got cut off. I don't know why. Um, yeah, and I, my, I took a shower today, so my hair is all blah right now. Um, anyway, this video is long enough, and I'm sure you don't want to hear me talking anymore. Of course, no one's seeing this video, but still, it's I'm trying to pretend that I'm talking to an audience other than myself. I'm trying to visualize talking to other people. This is part of the process of getting over that fear of talking to people and being more open. So I'm pretending that there's actual person watching this and gives a damn about anything that I'm saying. Um, so thank you if you watched this far. And uh, wow, I really, I really hope that I am that interesting because otherwise you wasted almost an hour on some dorky person. <laughs> so I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry that I'm dorky and I'm sorry that you're actually watching this you probably have better things to do like me sleep which never comes my insomnia is kicking in again hopefully i get a snatch of sleep before i have to take the kids to school and daycare and i do my interview hopefully but more than likely will not happen i'm surprised i'm even functioning right now but okay so uh i hope you guys are good and love you guys bye